Welcome to the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. In this video, let's work on the surface area for the last major flying surface of the UWS-1 Ultralight Airplane, and that's the vertical tail. We had a part one of designing the surface area for the vertical tail, and that's going to be in a link up here in the corner. In that one, we used the tail volume method to come up with surface area for the vertical tail. But this ultralight airplane is going to have twin engines, one on the left wing and one on the right wing. And if you have a condition where one of those motors fails, you're going to have an asymmetric thrust situation. And it's very likely that using the tail volume method to come up with the surface area isn't going to give us a big enough tail to counter that asymmetric thrust using the rudder. So in this video, we're going to figure out, well, just how big do we have to make that rudder and the vertical tail to counter that asymmetric thrust? If you're not interested in the math part, then stick around for the first part of the video, because in that part, we'll have some diagrams and I'll do a verbal description of the forces involved and how the airplane reacts. And then I'll let you know when we get to the point where we're doing the uh, math part of it, and you can bail out then if you want to. Let's get to it. In part one of the vertical tail sizing, we talked about using the tail volume method. And that's where you take the vertical tails of similar airplanes and calculate a tail volume, which is the surface area of the vertical tail multiplied by the arm, which is the distance from the mean aerodynamic cord of the vertical tail to the center of gravity. You multiply those two together and that gives you a volume. So once you have that volume, then you can use your arm, uh, divide that from the tail volume, and that'll give you your vertical tail surface area. And we did that in part one and it came up with an answer. In general, using that solution is not going to work for an asymmetric thrust situation like we're talking about. And that's why we're doing part two. But before we get to that, let's talk about the third method of coming up with the size of your vertical tail. And that's using a stability analysis of the lateral directional stability. In general, you don't really need to do this stability analysis if you're doing a conventional airplane configuration, which is a big main wing with a vertical and horizontal tail after that big main wing. The only reason to do this lateral directional stability analysis is if for some reason you want to make an exceptionally small tail or you have an unusual main wing, maybe it has a lot of sweep to it, something that's not quite conventional. So for this airplane, I'm not going to do this analysis unless for some reason I think I might have a stability problem in the lateral directional environment which leaves us with the condition of trying to calculate a tail volume to deal with a motor that has failed of a twin motor configuration. Now, if these motors are in line, let's say one in the nose and one in the tail, a tractor and a pusher configuration, where they're basically on the same thrust line, then you probably don't need to do this. When you have those motors placed laterally, in this case out on the wings, if one motor dies and the other one's still running, you're going to have a significant force yawing that airplane, trying to turn it left or turn it right, depending on which motor has failed. And we have to counter that yaw with our vertical tail. And we have to figure out how big does that vertical tail need to be to counter that yawing force. Well, that's what we're going to do now. Let's talk about some of the features of the twin motor and twin tail configuration that I'm considering using for the ultralight. One of the reasons for the twin tail and twin motor is redundancy. I have some long range plans of making the airplane be fly by wire. I may not ever do it, but it's a possibility that I've considered. And so I wanted to build the airplane with that in mind. So in this case, we could have twin rudders so that if the actuating mechanism on one of them failed, I'd still have the other rudder operational. And same thing with the motors. One fails, of course, we still have one that's operational. The placement of the rudders is out here on the tips of the horizontal tail to help reduce the possibility of blanketing when we're at a very high angle of attack. 
So at least the outer side of each rudder, unless you're yawing or slipping, should still be effective. And then another thing is that by having your rudders directly behind a motor, that makes the rudder slightly more effective. And that's because you're going to have a slightly higher speed of the wind hitting the rudder, and that will increase its Reynolds number, which will increase its effectiveness a little bit. And that will be beneficial if we have a motor out situation. One rudder will be acting as though it's in the free stream, except for possible turbulence from the non-spinning propeller. The other rudder will be in the higher speed air with the higher Reynolds number and be a little bit more effective. If we had a single rudder in the middle, in order to get the same effectiveness, it would have to be just a little bit bigger than the surface area of the two together. Well, that's probably not quite true. Having two rudders is not quite as efficient as one rudder, so it might end up being roughly equal. And then another feature that we'll have for these motors is that we'll have them spinning in a direction that causes P factor to move the force of the propeller inward as you increase your pitch angle. And that's gonna be important when we have an engine out condition. If we had them spinning the opposite direction when we were at a high angle of attack, let's say we're climbing and we have one engine fail, because of the P factor, the thrust of this motor would move out farther, which means it would have a larger moment and we'd have to make the tail even bigger to counter that. By giving the propeller a uh, the proper spin direction, that P factor will actually move inboard. Now I'm not going to take that into consideration in this analysis, I am going to assume that the thrust is always at the center of the prop. But as we're climbing, we actually have a little bit of advantage of having that thrust move inward a little bit. Unfortunately, I have not made an aero terminology video on what P factor is. So if you're not familiar with what that is, please look that up. It's easy to find on the internet. Um, I decided not to go ahead and get in the explanation here and this video because it's going to be long enough as it is. When we want to design the vertical tail to handle this asymmetric thrust issue, we want to try to select what the worst case situation is to uh, handle that asymmetric thrust. Well, one thing to think about is that when we are at lower speeds, our flying surfaces are less effective. In order to have them be effective, we're generally going to have to make them larger to deal with low speed issues. So the lower the speed is we have to design to handle an issue, the larger our vertical tail is going to have to be. So one of the limits that we can come up with to know how much thrust we have to deal with is that we will say that we will have to have at least as much thrust as necessary to have level flight at the velocity where we have our maximum lift to drag. In other words, the thrust of one engine has to be at least as much or more than the drag that we'll have at our maximum lift to drag. So that gives us kind of a lower bound on how much thrust we're going to have to deal with. Our worst case scenario is probably going to be when we are trying to do our best climb angle. We're going to be at a very low speed and we'll talk a little bit more about what that speed is and we're going to be at full thrust. So that's probably our worst case scenario. And just as a point of reference, that speed, best angle of climb, is lower than the speed that we have at maximum lift to drag. Let's talk about the forces acting on the airplane when we have one of the motors die. So this is the top view of the UWS-1 in its current configuration. So let's assume that we have, to start with, the free airstream being straight on the nose, coming down. So all these angled air rolls would not be angled, they'd be straight back for drag. We have one motor here with this blue air roll, that's thrust. And when they're both running, they would both have this blue air roll the same length. When one of these motors dies, in this case I'm showing that this one has died, I'm going to assume that the prop stops. Now the worst case drag is at some windmilling speed, but I don't at the moment know how to calculate what that would be, so I'm going to assume that the motor stops. And what we'll end up having is a drag from this stopped prop, and I do have a way to calculate what that drag is. 
So what's going to happen with this asymmetric thrust and asymmetric drag? In this diagram, what will attempt to happen is this thrust being over here on the left side of our center of gravity. It's going to try to cause the nose of the airplane to yaw to the right. This drag will do the same thing. It's over on the right hand side and dragging backwards. It's also going to cause this airplane to yaw to the right. Well, this yawing is a moment and that moment is going to be the magnitude of this thrust or drag and the distance of that from the center of gravity perpendicular to that thrust or drag. So in this case, we've got this thrust here and where it's perpendicular to the center of gravity is right here. And so what we would do to figure out what the moment is, that yawing moment, is we multiply that thrust by this distance. Same thing with this drag. When the drag is straight up and down, and that's what it is the moment that this prop stops and the motor stops, of course, it doesn't happen instantaneous, but for now, let's just assume that it does. This arrow would be straight back, and the moment by this prop drag would be the drag of the prop. By the way, it's got the same units as thrust. It's going to be pounds times the distance perpendicular to that. One of the things we're going to design to is to make this vertical tail and rudder big enough that we can actually keep this airplane going straight ahead and not have it yaw. A yawing angle is this beta. So beta is the difference between the nose line and the actual free stream. That angle there is beta and that gets used in a lot of the uh, literature that you'll see. Oh, by the way, this thrust should be over here. I drew this diagram so that I could show some of the consequences of having a static yaw angle. So let's say this does get yawed over this direction. In that case, that's what these arrows are represent is drag from various things because drag is going to be collinear with this free stream. So basically it's going to be this direction, the same direction as the free stream. Lift, I'm representing by these green arrows, is going to be perpendicular to the free stream. And in this case, it's the lift, which is horizontal lift, caused by our vertical tail and rudders. And I try to make these arrows kind of represent magnitude. Not exactly, but kind of. For example, when you start yawing, you're actually going to have some aerodynamic force on this fuselage that's forward of the CG. Since there's a lot of surface area, there's going to be some drag from it, and it's going to be dragging to the left of the CG. So it's actually going to be trying to go in the opposite direction of this yaw. Your rudders will not have quite the same amount of drag or lift, and that's because of something I mentioned before. We have this running prop over here with a slightly higher airspeed, so lift and drag should both be a little bit higher on this vertical tail than on the stopped one. And because of yaw, this fuselage is going to be creating some turbulence on this side. Now that turbulence underneath that wing is going to reduce the lift a little bit, this yaw also ends up reducing the effective span of the wing. So this span that I'm showing here, because of this angle, is a little bit less than the span would be when the free stream is straight on. That means we're going to lose just a little bit of lift, which means we've got to increase the angle of attack a little bit. Another thing is that we're probably going to have to roll the airplane a little bit, and I'll talk about more why that is in a moment. But we're going to have one aileron that goes up, another aileron that has to go down. The aileron that goes down, because it's creating more lift, is going to have a little more drag than the aileron that goes up. That's why these two arrows are not quite the same length. They're going to have a uh, arm also, which is going to be the drag multiplied by its distance, perpendicular to this drag. Same thing with the rudder back here. Lift is going to be causing a moment, so it's going to be the force of the lift, which is in pounds, multiplied by its distance to the CG, perpendicular to this lift, and of course, same with the drag. Now, when we're yawing, we have an interesting thing happening. Once we start yawing, we can think about this thrust being in two different dimensions. One is going to be collinear with this free stream, and the other one is going to be perpendicular to that. If you add these two up like you would in a triangle, the square of this thrust and the square of this thrust added together, and then the square root of that would equal this length of this thrust. This is the thrust 
into the free stream. So this is the propulsive thrust. It's also trying to rotate the airplane from this distance. This thrust is trying to rotate the airplane, just like the propulsive thrust, although the distance would be here. But in addition, it's trying to pull the airplane to the left, sideways. Let's talk a little bit about some of the consequence of what we have here. And let's go back to what I said earlier, where I said, I would like to design this vertical tail and rudder to be big enough that the airplane will fly straight ahead. And that's because we can keep all this drag to a minimum by flying straight ahead. Whenever we have this yaw angle, we start increasing drag. The fuselage has more drag. The rudders will have more drag. We'll have more drag because we have to increase the pitch of the airplane. And that means more lift, which means more induced drag, etc. That means that this green arrow then will be straight out, in this case to the right, because we want to counter this thrust and this drag. So we have to have an arm going the other direction. Well, there's a little bit of an issue here then. So if we're going straight into the free stream, the free stream is coming straight down the fuselage, we're now having a force to the right. You remember some of the previous videos we talked about, if we have a non-rotating frame of reference, in other words, we're not yawing or pitching or rolling about any of our axis, there's no movement except forward. In that case, all the forces on the airplane have to sum up to be zero. Well, looky here, we've got this green arrow to the right. All these red arrows would be straight back. There's no other arrow to the left to counter this. That means our airplane will start moving to the right. Our side forces do not add up to zero, and that will end up turning the airplane. Well, we don't want that. We need some kind of force to the left to counter this force to the right, not the rotating stuff. Summing all the left and right forces should add up to zero. So we need a force going to the left that equals the force going to the right. You might reasonably ask, well, you've got this portion of your thrust that's in the opposite direction of the lift of the rudders. Well, why not just let your beta increase enough that this sideways thrust would equal the thrust to your rudders and that would then equal and you won't be yawing anymore. And early on in working on the research for this, I thought, that's reasonable, why don't we try that? So I went through the calculations and I found out that I would have to yaw up to 20 degrees to have enough sideways thrust to cancel out the lift of the rudders. On the face of it, that's a solution that ought to work, but <laughs> think about yawing that far, 20 degrees we're gonna have a massive amount of increase in drag on the fuselage. We're gonna have more drag on the rudders and vertical stabilizers because they're gonna now be at a much higher angle of attack. We're gonna have a significant loss in lift because we now have decreased our aspect ratio, which of course causes our lift line to decrease, which means we've lost lift, so now we gotta pitch up. Well, you pitch up, to try to increase lift. Of course, that increases induced drag, so we've caused more drag there. I didn't bother calculating the huge amount of increase in drag we would have, but I'm fairly confident that we would probably not be able to maintain level flight. We would probably not have enough thrust to overcome all that drag. So that doesn't seem like a viable option. So there must be some other solution to this. Well, that's what this next chart is about. Well, here we have a view of the UWS-1 looking from the front. Now, it's a little harder to draw some of these forces on here, but this green arrow here is the lift force from the vertical tail and rudder on the starboard side, the right side. Here is the same thing, lift from the vertical tail and rudder on the port side. This is the motor that's running. This is the prop that has stopped. So there's thrust coming straight out the page at you from this one, drag going into the page from this one. We have these two rudder lifts to our left. We need something to counter those going to the right. But we still want to have the airplane flying straight ahead. In other words, having the beta be zero. Well, what we can do is roll the airplane a little bit. Once we do that, the lift component changes. So the lift is perpendicular to the uh, wing, but there's a vertical component 
and a horizontal component when we roll that wing. Now this vertical component, if we're not accelerating up or down, you add these two together. This is the one wing and this is the other wing. You, originally I had planned on talking about a little bit of yaw and having lift be reduced on this wing because of turbulence under here, but I decided not to. So we're just flying straight ahead. So the lifts on both wings will be the same, but you add this vertical and this vertical together and it's going to equal the weight of the airplane. That means the length of this one is more than the weight of the airplane when you add them together because of this horizontal component. Well, guess what? We now have a horizontal component we can use to counter this horizontal component. So if we roll the airplane just enough so that these two add together, will cancel these two add together, voila. We now are able to fly straight ahead. Now we are going to have a little bit of a consequence of that. We're going to have to have a rudder lift up on one side and down on the other. That means there's going to be a little bit of a drag from this aileron, a little bit more from this one than from this one. It will increase the drag of the airplane overall just a little bit. And there's going to be a moment because this one's bigger. It's going to try to yaw the nose to our right, the airplane's left. We're getting pretty close to the moment of doing calculations and what are the things that we need to calculate? Well, we need to know what the moment of that one motor thrusting is. And we need to know what the thrust of that motor is. I put here that we need the drag of the aileron so that we can calculate the moment of the aileron, but it's going to turn out not to be significant, so I'm going to end up ignoring that. We need to know the drag of the stopped propeller and then we can calculate its moment. We need to know the moment of our vertical tail. So that's going to be lift multiplied by its distance from the center of gravity. And then from all that, we should be able to calculate size of the vertical tail. Before we get too far into it, let's talk about some of the simplifications and assumptions we're going to use. Now, this could get to be horribly complicated and horribly detailed. I don't really want to do that. I want to make a fairly good estimate, but without a whole lot of trouble. We're going to assume that our worst condition for having a motor fail on us is when we're at best angle of climb. And we already talked about why that is, because we're going to be going very slow. We've already calculated what the thrust is going to be at best angle of a climb from the previous video, the first thrust and horsepower estimate. So we can go get our thrust from that. And that is 57 pounds for one motor. Both of them together is 114 pounds of thrust. So for one motor, we'll have 57 pounds of thrust. And we also calculated in that video that the forward speed, the horizontal speed, is 30.3 knots. So now we know what speed we need to do our calculations at. And again, as I said before, we're going to have that yaw angle, beta, be zero. That'll give us our minimum drag. And as I talked about previously, we're going to counter the lift, the sideways lift of that rudder with rolling the wing in the opposite direction of our rudder lift. And that will keep us from drifting sideways and turning. Well, again, here's the top view of the airplane. And I got rid of all those complex angles when we have a little bit of a yaw. So we're going straight ahead. We have one motor running, one motor dead. And we have lift from each of our vertical tails and we have a little more drag from each of our vertical tails. Now fortunately this is going to be kind of the minimum drag situation for these vertical tails since we're going straight ahead. If we allowed the airplane to yaw a little bit we'd have more drag. And I've come up with the distances out to these forces based on the current configuration for the UWS-1. And I've come up here with the distances. So distance to the thrust. So for the center of gravity over the thrust, looks like I have these two backwards. So I've actually at one time had the thrust on this side and the drag on this side, and I forgot to get these two labels swapped around. So they should be swapped, but it doesn't really matter. They're the same value. So distance to the thrust is 3.4 feet. Distance to the drag, again, 3.4 feet. The distance to the vertical tail on the starboard side and the port side, that's the distance front to back. So distance from the center of gravity to the mean aerodynamic core of the vertical tail, that's 10.25 feet. The distance from the center line to that vertical tail, that's D rudder starboard and D rudder port, that's 3.9 feet. 
And something that you'll need to know here shortly is that uh, Q, and we've talked about Q when you're calculating lift and surface area for a flying surface, is going to be at 30.3 knots, and that Q value then is 3.11, and we'll need that here before too long. Now you'll notice I didn't show drag for the ailerons, and you'll find out why shortly, but we're going to end up ignoring drag for the ailerons. We're also going to end up ignoring drag for the rudder since I think it's going to be pretty insignificant. From here on out, we're going to be doing calculations. I'm going to try to keep from delving too far in the details. I'll have details in the slides, but I'll probably gloss over quite a few of them because people really aren't that interested in the arithmetic. But it will be there for those people who really are interested in it. And by the way, it's always possible I've made a mistake in my calculations. If you find a mistake, please leave a comment and let me know about it. If I have to, I'll just take this video down and fix it and put it back up again. Well, at this point, we have enough information to calculate the moment from our thrusting motor. So I said that distance out to that thrusting motor was 3.4 feet from the center of gravity, and that thrust from that one motor is 57 pounds. And I've said before that we can ignore the p-factor effects from climbing at this best rate of climb. So the simple calculation, multiply the distance times the thrust, that gives us our moment. So I'm going to call it m sub t for the moment of the thrust. And once we calculate all that together, oh, by the way, my convention is going to be if the moment is clockwise, it's going to be negative. If it's counterclockwise, it'll be positive. And we want all these moments to add up to zero, which we'll talk about here in a moment. <laughs> no pun intended. So if we do this calculation, we have almost 20 foot-pounds of moment just from the thrust. We're going to use this value a little bit later. Well, now let's figure out the moment that we have from the drag of the propeller that has stopped. It's not spitting. That's not too bad. There's just a little bit more math and some references we need to use. We need a coefficient of drag of our propeller propeller blade. Now using information from Horner from fluid dynamic drag, we got this little equation here. Now this beta is not the angle of the yaw in this particular case. This is the angle of the propeller at its 70% radius. So 0.1 multiply the cosine squared of whatever that propeller angle is, 70% of the radius of the propeller. Once we have that coefficient of drag of the blade, we multiply by the surface area of the blades, multiplied by Q, and that gives us the drag of the propeller that's not running. I used OpenVSP to create a propeller that I thought would probably be correct for the ultralight. So it turns out the surface area from one blade is about half a square foot, and then we got three blades, so it ends up being one and a half square feet. And Horner says that on a typical propeller, the blade angle at the 70% radius is 18 degrees. And in that case, going through this wonderful equation, you end up getting coefficient of drag of the blades of 1, which is kind of convenient. And then using Q, in this case, I use 30 knots instead of the 30.3. That turns out to be 3.05 for Q. And then using this equation up here, running the numbers in here, we end up with a little over 4.5 pounds of drag of that propeller that's not running. And again, it's out 3.4 feet from the center of gravity, so our moment is going to be minus 15.5 foot-pounds. And it's trying to turn the airplane in the same direction as the thrust, so that's a negative. It's trying to turn it to the right, or clockwise. I said before that we have to have the sum of those moments equal zero, otherwise we'll be yawing. And those, again, are going to be the thrust, the propeller, the vertical tail, and aileron moments. Now, in mathematical form, that's this here, moment of thrust, propeller, vertical tail, and aileron, together have to be equal zero. And this is the moments expanded out a little bit. So thrust, distance to the thrust, drag the prop, distance to that prop, lift of the vertical tail, distance to the vertical tail, lift of the aileron, and distance to the aileron. In this case, it's actually be drag and not lift. And those, again, equal zero. Now we're going to set the moment of the ailerons to zero. And we'll talk about why here before long. But basically, it's because it's almost nothing. 
and it's going to be difficult to calculate. And since I know it's going to be close to nothing, that means we're just going to ignore it. Well, what we're trying to calculate is the lift of the vertical tail, and we now have enough information to do that. So this is rearranged, so lift of the vertical tail is over here, everything else is over here now. We plug in our numbers, and we get 20.4 pounds that our two vertical tails together have to exert to counter thrust and propeller moments. Now we're going to go ahead and cut that in half and assign half of it to each vertical tail of 10.2. Now in reality they're not going to be equal. One vertical tail will have a little bit more lift than the other one, but for now I'm just going to assign them to be equal. Now we're going to get into why I think we could ignore the uh, drag from these ailerons. Now I've rearranged this a little bit, although these arrows on the lift for the vertical tails aren't quite right. The longer one should be over here on the right hand side. But I've uh, moved this lift vector from out here where they were in the middle. Now we know that the vertical lift, if we're not accelerating up or down, this vertical lift is 448 pounds. And that is with standard pilot, the 24 pound parachute, and the 254 pound empty weight limit for an ultralight airplane. So that's going to be this vertical component. I know how much I want this horizontal component to be. We just calculated that. We want the sum of these horizontal components of the vertical tail to be exactly countered by the horizontal component of the rolled airplane. So we want this horizontal component to be 20.4 pounds. Well now that we know this value and this value, we can calculate what the angle is, how much roll angle we have. The way I chose to do it is to go ahead and calculate this long arrow, which is the combination of vertical and horizontal. The way you do that is square the horizontal, square the vertical, add them together, and then take the square root. And that's what I did here. So this uh, component here, the long one, is 448.5 pounds. So <laughs> it's only half a pound bigger than the vertical component which means that this angle here has to be pretty darn small. Well, let's calculate what that is. And that's pretty easy. We're going to take the inverse sine of this vertical component and the long component. So that's what this is, the vertical part of the lift over the weight. And by doing that little calculation, we find out this angle then that we've rolled is 2.6 degrees. Well, that's a pretty darn small angle, which is great because that means our ailerons only have to deflect a tiny little bit to get that roll. Well, since it's a tiny deflection, it's a tiny little bit of drag, and we're just going to ignore it. I don't think there will be enough moment from the drag on this aileron that's doing the lift to worry about. So that's great. That makes it easier for us. Well, we're getting close to trying to calculate the surface area that we need for each of our vertical tails. Now, this equation should look familiar to you. This is the lift equation. So you take your lift divided by the quantity of Q and your coefficient of lift, and that gives you your surface area. Well, we know what Q is, 3.11, although we used a slightly different value of 3.05 before, that, but that's fine. Our lift is going to be the amount of lift of the vertical tail, so that's sideways lift. So each vertical tail is doing 10.2 pounds. We talked about that before. What is our coefficient of lift going to be? Well, let's think about that. What do we want to consider in trying to determine this? Well, one of the things is we don't want our rudder to have to be fully deflected in order to fly straight ahead with just one motor running. If we were fully deflected, that means we couldn't turn. So let's say we have our left motor running and right one failed, just like we've had in our, all of our pictures so far. That means we have to have left rudder to counter it. Let's say we had to deflect that rudder all the way to the left to counter our asynchronous thrust just to go straight ahead. That means we could not make a left turn. We could only go straight ahead or make right hand turns by letting off on the rudder a little bit. Well, that's no good. Now we probably could make a turn really by rolling more to the left, but we certainly couldn't do it with the rudder and that's just not good. So we'd like to have the coefficient of lift be sufficient with a partially deflected rudder so that if we want to turn to the left, we just deflect it more. 
And the other thing is, we really don't want our vertical tail to stall on us while we are uh, countering this asynchronous thrust. Let's take a little bit of that into account. It shouldn't be a big deal. It would be in a dynamic case. Let's say the pilot was too slow on getting on that rudder and countering the asynchronous thrust, and we end up yawing way to the right. And it's swinging. There's momentum to the airplane now, yawing to the right. And now we're going to slam in as much rudder as we can to try to counter it. Well, if we yaw too far, let's say we yaw maybe up to 30 degrees or so, we could potentially stall that vertical tail. And then in that case, we're going to keep on yawing to the right. So we want to try to give the pilot as much time as we can to get that rudder in by moving that uh, stall out as far as we can, at least practically. Now we're going to find out there's some compromises to do that. Let's get to that. Well, you know what? Something that might be fun to try is from the part one of calculating the vertical tail size where we used the tail volume, we came up with roughly four square feet for each vertical tail. Let's plug that in and see what happens. So if we do that, we have our lift of 10.2 pounds, we have our Q of 3.11, we have a surface area of 3.95, we plug all that in and it gives us a coefficient of lift of 0.82. That's kind of interesting. Let's, uh, let's see if that actually works. Well, we're getting ready to do some interesting calculations here. But before we get into it, we need to talk a little bit about aspect ratio and how it affects our coefficient lift. Particularly since we generally design our airfoils in 2D, that's a section coefficient lift, that's not the same as the three-dimensional flying surface. It's going to have a different coefficient lift. So we're going to have to do some aspect ratio calculations, and we talked about this in the horizontal tail design. Now, if you remember right, let's see, I think we have, yeah, here we go. Now, this is two-dimensional calculations of coefficient lift versus angle of attack. If you remember, we talked about how this is for basically an infinite wing, this slope of coefficient lift versus angle of attack. And when you start adding real aspect ratio, it starts making the slope of this line here flatter. And the lower that aspect ratio, in other words, the stubbier the wing is, the lower and lower this line gets. That means you get less coefficient lift at a particular angle than the two-dimensional one is. Now, fortunately, it also tends to move that maximum coefficient lift farther out to a higher angle of attack, but you end up usually losing a little bit too. So that's the maximum coefficient lift is generally going to be kind of an arc coming down like this. Let's go back to talk about aspect ratio since we need to come up with a realistic slope on this coefficient lift versus angle of attack. Now we can calculate the geometric angle of attack of the rudder. That's pretty easy to do. Well, it's a little harder for us because we have an interesting <laughs> leading edge and trailing edge slope to our vertical tail, but we can calculate it fairly closely. But that's not the same as the effective aspect ratio. Let's talk about how our configuration changes our effective aspect ratio. Our vertical tail is attached out to the ends of our horizontal tail. And something we really didn't take into account when we were doing our horizontal tail is that the vertical tail is, acts like a winglet or a plate out at the end of that flying surface. It actually increases our effective aspect ratio. It's as though that horizontal tail was longer. Well, when we go to work on a vertical tail, we have something similar happen. That horizontal tail is going to be like a winglet or a plate at one end of our horizontal tail. That means our aspect ratio of our vertical tail is going to be a little bit more than its actual geometric aspect ratio. Well, how much is that going to be? Well, unfortunately, I don't have an exact number, but we can take an educated guess. And if we use this reference of aerodynamics, aeronautics, and flight mechanics from McCormick, which is the second edition, he gives us some interesting multiplication factors to use. For example, if we have a T-tail rudder where we have the rudder attached to the fuselage and then the horizontal tail sitting on top of the rudder, 
effective aspect ratio is going to be 1.9 times the actual geometric aspect ratio. So it almost doubles the aspect ratio of the actual rudder. Now Horner in his fluid dynamic lift uses 1.8. So it's, it's somewhere around 1.8 or 1.9. If you have a conventional rudder attached to the fuselage and that horizontal tail is also attached to the fuselage right about the root of the rudder, then the horizontal tail acts like an end plate, at least on one end. By the way, let me go back up here. The reason that this is so high is the horizontal tail is an end plate and the fuselage at the other end of the rudder also acts as a partial end plate. So when we get down here to this situation where one end of the rudder is in free air, but the other end is uh, end plated by the horizontal tail, you don't have quite as large a factor. So you take your geometric aspect ratio multiplied by 1.6 and that gives you your effective aspect ratio. Well, we don't quite have that situation. Our rudders are at the ends of the horizontal tail. So we basically have half an end plate for each vertical tail. Now it would be easy to assume that then we should probably have a factor of 1.3 for each vertical tail. We take the geometric aspect ratio multiply by 1.3 and that should give us our effective aspect ratio of the tails we're talking about for our airplane. But we do have a little bit of an issue. Let me uh, go all the way back up to the top and show you. So you can kind of see here, here's our two vertical tails and our horizontal tail is here. We have our vertical tails back a little bit from the horizontal tail. They're not actually end capping the horizontal tail. They're shifted back about half of the cord of the rudder and about half the cord of the horizontal tail. So it's not exactly a winglet or end plate. It's back just a little bit so it's not quite as effective. So instead of using 1.3, I thought what would probably be reasonable is to use a factor of 1.2. So we will take the geometric aspect ratio, multiply by 1.2, and that'll give us our effective aspect ratio for our vertical tail. Well, this brings up something to think about. If we start running into problems with weight on the airplane, we could switch to a T-tail configuration. And that should let us reduce our rudder size by around 50% uh, just because of the difference in effective aspect ratio. And at cruise, we should have less drag because we don't have the rudder in the prop wash anymore. But for now, I'm going to stick with our current configuration because I like having a slightly more effective rudder when we have a failed motor, just for safety reasons. Let's talk a little bit more about what I have here for the coefficient of lift versus angle of attack. Now I used the XFLR5 software to come up with an airfoil for a horizontal tail and I'm thinking about using the same airfoil for the vertical tail. And it's called the UWS-1 tail 12% thick airfoil. I'm probably going to do a little bit more information on rudder design and I'll talk about that at the very end of the video. And it's possible that I'll change airfoils, but I'll probably stick with this one at least for this initial analysis. This particular graph here is for the airfoil when it does not have the rudder deflected. This next one is with rudder deflected. 10%. This one is rudder deflected 20% and this was rudder deflected 25%. Now as you can see there's a little bit of trouble in here especially with the 20% uh, deflected rudder. We're getting some very odd values in here. Now part of this is probably valid. For example here on the 10% what we're probably doing is getting a separation of the air right at the hinge line because the deflected rudder once we get up to this zero angle of attack. And by the way, zero angle of attack, it's talking about the front part of the vertical tail, in other words, the vertical stabilizer. So this is angle attack of the vertical stabilizer, not the rudder itself. The rudder is just the deflection. So it's probably correct that we're getting a little separation here. 
And there's probably a separation here, although it looks like it's showing maybe two separations. And they're really highly deflected, rather, to 20% deflection. I think this is very problematic down here. But I think it's still good enough to do our calculations. Now, one thing I'll say about this airfoil that I really like, it has a much broader stall, softer stall than the other airfoils I looked at. Most of them come up, fall down much sharper, and then come out to pretty low where it starts picking up again on the coefficient lift. But one of the drawbacks to this one is it doesn't have quite as high a maximum coefficient lift. And but we'll probably talk about that more in the rudder video. Well, now we need to do some calculations. This delta up here, delta sub r, represents the deflection of the rudder. So in this case, this 25 degrees is, means that the rudder has been deflected at 25 degrees. So if you see that in literature, you'll know what that means. This is also used for deflection of the elevator and deflection of ailerons, this delta is. One of the things we need to do now is calculate the slope of this line. And this is going to be then the rise, which is coefficient lift over run, which is angle of attack, because we're going to use that in calculating the difference between the two-dimensional coefficient lift and the actual 3D surface coefficient lift. Something to uh, keep in mind here, if you see a C sub small l, that means two-dimensional coefficient lift. If you see a C sub capital L, that means the wing or three-dimensional coefficient lift. Hopefully I haven't made any mistakes on these. Now alpha represents the angle of attack in degrees. So if we do just do a quick rise over run, uh, what I did is I looked at where the line looks like it's passing through zero. I looked at how many degrees that is below zero. And then I looked at what the coefficient lift is at zero. So this would be run, and this would be rise. So that's how I did this calculation. So for the 25 degree, we had a lift of 1.136, and we had a run of 19 degrees. So you calculate that, and we get this slope of 0 0.0598. And that is this line here. That's the 25 degree one. Now I've got a little nifty spreadsheet that I am going to put on Patreon for my designer and builder tiers to calculate what the three-dimensional slope is given the two-dimensional slope and your effective aspect ratio. And it's a really simple little spreadsheet. You can actually go and find the equation if you want to in the reference from McCormick that I mentioned before. Uh, so you can calculate it yourself or you can uh, join one of those tiers and you can get the spreadsheet to do the calculation for you. I came up with an effective aspect ratio of 2.76. I will talk a little bit more about that shortly, but by using this 2.76 and this two-dimensional slope, I was able to come up with the slope for the three-dimensional vertical tail. And it drops quite a bit. You can see it's 0.287. So by having a real aspect ratio in there, it made it much flatter. Now, something that we can use then is we take the ratio of these ratios. So if we take the uh, 2.87 and put it over the top of this 0 0.0598, the ratio of this number to this number is 0 0.510. Well, now, since we have this, we can calculate a... 3D lift coefficient from the 2D lift coefficient. So if we have some particular angle of attack we're interested in, and we're always interested in zero here, we can take the coefficient lift in this diagram, this 2D diagram, multiply it by 0 0.510, and that'll give us what the 3D coefficient lift is gonna be for the vertical tail. Now, one thing that I do wanna comment on, I'm assuming that in this calculation that we can believe that the zero crossing is the same for both 2D and 3D slopes of the coefficient versus angle of attack. Now in real life, that's not true. Generally, when you go to add a real aspect ratio, that zero crossing will move just a little bit to the right. But 
it's a little harder to calculate and it doesn't really move enough to bother us. So in our calculations here, we're just going to ignore that that zero crossing can move to the right just a little bit. Well, now let's find out if with our rudder fully deflected and using that service area we had from part one of our video, can we counter the asynchronous thrust? In other words, is that original service area we came up with adequate? Okay, let's do our calculation. So the coefficient lift we had in two dimensions when the rust is fully deflected and our beta, in other words, our yaw angle is at zero, we had 1.14. That means our three dimensional coefficient of lift should be that 0 0.150, which was this ratio here, multiplied by our two dimensional coefficient of lift which gives us a three-dimensional coefficient lift of 0.581. All right, well, we now have a coefficient lift. Well, that's interesting because previously we said that we need a coefficient lift of 0.82 in order to counter the asynchronous thrust. Let's go back up there. So here's where we did that calculation where we had a lift, sideways lift of 10.2, Q of 3.11 and our surface area 3.95, we said in order for that to work, we need a 0.82 coefficient lift. But what we really have is 0.58. Well, darn it, that means our coefficient lift is not high enough, at least not with this amount of surface area. Well, <laughs> that means we need more surface area. Okay, let's calculate what we need for the real surface area then. That uh, surface area we got from part one just is not big enough. We said before that we really don't want that rudder fully deflected when we're in the straight ahead attitude, countering that asymmetric thrust. I'm going to somewhat arbitrarily pick, uh, let's have a 15% deflection of that rudder be enough to counter that asymmetric thrust. We could try to go higher. We could maybe go up to a 20 degree deflection, but let's go back and look at our diagram here. There is not a whole lot of difference between this 20 degree deflection and 25 degree deflection. So I, you know, if we make a mistake and we didn't really calculate this coefficient lift correctly, it could be that this 20 degree deflection won't be enough. We may have to go up to 25. So I'd like to have a little bit of margin there. So I decided let's go with a 15 degree. Now I did not show it here in this picture. I did calculate it though. And 15 degrees would be right in this area. So that gives us just a little bit more margin. When I did that calculation for a 50, 15 degree deflection at a zero angle of attack, I have a coefficient lift of 0.934. Okay, now we need to go through the slope calculations we did before. So it turned out to be a coefficient lift of zero angle of attack, 0.934. The angle back to the zero crossing was 11.9 degrees. That gave us a 0 0.0785 slope. Now I used that spreadsheet I just talked about to calculate what the slope of the three-dimensional coefficient lift would be using the effective aspect ratio of 2.76 like we did before and that is a 0 0.0377 and if we take the ratio of this number and this number that gives us 0 0.510 we can use that to actually now calculate coefficient of lift so we multiply this ratio by our coefficient of lift that's this calculation here that gives us a coefficient lift of 0.5 Four seven six. So this is our three-dimensional vertical tail coefficient lift when we're deflecting 15 degrees. Well, now let's go back and calculate how much our surface area can be. So we have our 10 pounds of force of lift of the vertical tail, our Q of 3.11. Oh, oops, I had just realized that I had an old number in here and I stopped the recording and went and fixed it. So now this number is correct. This is our coefficient lift from up here, the 0.476. When you calculate all this out, it gives us a new surface area of 6.89. So let's compare that to what we had for the vertical tail volume of you know, roughly four. So we had to go from four square feet up to nearly seven square feet in order to be able to counter that asymmetric thrust.
and that's really pretty much what I expected. We didn't, it's not quite doubling it, but uh, it's increasing it quite a bit. And I expected we would have to. I didn't think that vertical tail volume method would give us enough moment on that vertical tail to counter the asynchronous thrust. Okay, so we now have a surface area for one vertical tail. So each vertical tail will have this 6.09 square feet of surface area. All right, well, we can proceed on with more calculations for the airplane. Let's find out what's next. What I want to do is proceed on to getting enough figured out that we can start making a rudder. Making a plug, making a mold, making a rudder. So the sequence of events we're going to need to do that is we need to start working on the rudder airfoil and the hinge location for that rudder. So I'll do a video on that. That'll be pretty easy. We'll have some interesting references to look at. Look at something called nose overhang, uh, the hinge location, how that affects, affects uh, the effectiveness. That'll be a pretty fun video, pretty easy. Once we have that, we have enough information to make a 3D CAD drawing of our rudder and vertical tail. And once we have our 3D CAD drawing, I will start building the rudder plug and maybe the vertical tail plug. I'll, I'll go ahead and build, definitely build a vertical tail plug. Um, I'll have to figure out whether I want to make a separate plug for the rudder or not. I may not need to. I'll figure that out when I get to it. And at the same time we're doing that, we'll be starting to calculate the aerodynamic loads that the rudder and vertical tail will have on it. We need to know those loads so we can start doing the structural design of the rudder and the vertical tail. And once we have the structural design, we will start building the rudder. Of course, we have to build the molds from the plug first, but we're getting closer. I'll be making videos on almost all these steps, probably all of them which means we've got lots of videos still coming up on just the rudder and vertical tail. And there will be videos on testing. Once we, have a, once we have a rudder built and a vertical tail, we'll start doing testing. We'll do load testing on it to see how well it compares to our calculations. And something I would like to do that I don't know if I get to it, but I, I really want to, is I would like to do some aerodynamic testing. In other words, running some wind over the vertical tail and rudder and see if it actually matches some of our calculations. I don't know exactly how I'm going to do that yet. I don't have access to a wind tunnel. So what I'm thinking of doing is building a rig on my truck that we can instrument and a remotely control from the cab of the truck and we can do some remote data logging and uh, go out and run this thing up and down the road and, and do some aerodynamic testing on it. That's a very real possibility. Well, I hope you enjoyed these design videos. Don't forget that we have a playlist, and I'll put a link to it here, that you can go to and look at other design videos. Of course, we have other playlists. For example, we have a playlist for our materials testing that we're currently doing. We have playlists for construction videos which we will start adding to pretty quick as soon as we start doing plugs and molds so uh, don't forget to go to look at those playlists and if you haven't done it yet go ahead and subscribe stay tuned for these videos coming up